everyone here. Um, obviously, Visa is delighted to be sponsoring this year's campus party, the first one here in Milan. I'm delighted to be back in Milan. Obviously, a very important market for us in Europe. Um, but when I walk around and see some of the themes, whether it's robotics, artificial intelligence, augmented reality, blockchain, some of the things that you're going to talk about over the next three days, you know, all of these things are also converging and transforming commerce. And so what I wanted to do for a few minutes this evening is just talk about some of the things that we see that are forever changing the landscape in terms of payments and commerce, and, and maybe how differently you should think about it as people focusing on the future technologies and how they're going to apply to a banking and a payments and a commerce world that will, that will never be the same. So the first point I make is that the pace of change is faster than we've ever seen. You know, for, for 60 years, and that's really how long the way we think about modern payments has been around, it was really a tightly controlled ecosystem with the merchants, the banks, and the networks like Visa that were really controlling the pace of innovation. We got to decide when those physical card readers were re replaced by electronic readers. We actually got to design the ATMs and, 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 and design their rollout. But what we see now is that thousands of new players startups like you're having pitched over here, or some of the biggest technology players in the world like Amazon or Google, Facebook, Apple, Samsung, Microsoft, are all coming into the space and forever changing commerce. And so what was an ecosystem that we were very familiar with and that we got to control is now being driven by new players whose maybe core business is not commerce, but they're so effective in building their social networks or their technology platforms or their devices and, and it's these things that are starting to drive commerce. And so when you think about the pace of change, the, the thing that's constant in our industry today is that it's moving faster than it ever has, that there's new technologies that are just coming over the corner almost every day, and that as a payments network, as a banking ecosystem, as, a, as an ecosystem of merchants, we've got to change quicker than we've ever had to before. At the core of this, is technologies that aren't even related directly to payments that are driving banks and, and, and companies like Visa to different places in the technology stack. If, if you think about the way that millennials and every other generation after that want to conduct commerce, it, it's, they don't even want to go to their bank anymore, never mind even going to a mobile app. They want commerce where they want to conduct it. They want to do it on their phone, they want to do it on a large screen, they want to do it in the cloud, they, they want to do it virtually, they want to do it in their social networks, and it's incumbent upon our industry to drive this omni-commerce experience where we take advantage of technologies, whether it's biometrics or location-based technologies or social networks or chatbots or what's happening with artificial intelligence or natural language, and create new commerce experiences that we've never seen before, but actually bring those experiences to where people want to have them. As I said in my first slide, in the old days, we got to put the bank branches where we wanted them. We got to put the ATMs where we wanted them. But now, commerce is everywhere. And it's increasingly going to be where millennials and every generation after that want commerce to be. What's also changing the way that payment networks like Visa and banks are thinking about commerce and payments is that people's expectations about what we do aren't driven by what's happening in financial services last year. It's what's happening with all these other omni-channel experiences today. It's not good enough for Visa or your neighborhood bank to just keep up with each other and to compete on marketing um, or, or, or to compete on price. We're now competing with brand new customer experiences that build all of your social networking habits, that build your location, that build your affinity to your devices and all your devices the physical relationships that you have besides the virtual ones, and all of this are driving your expectations. And so if you have an expectation um, about your house, about your connectivity, about your social networks, about your transportation, about your social life, all of those that are being driven increasingly by mobile and apps, connectivity, social networks, you're driving those expectations into commerce. And so it's not good enough for us just to keep up with the fastest bank or the best network. We're now competing with all of the big players and those brand new technology and experiences that they're bringing to you. And new generations have, have, have new expectations. So 
I'm old enough that when I got my bank account, I was given my first 20 Canadian dollars up from Canada, and I went to my bank and I deposited it and I got a paper passbook. And every time I got the next $20, I went back to the bank and I got an update on my paper passbook. I got a credit card before I got a debit card because debit wasn't invented, right? My, my experience was very much banking to commerce. Banks were very familiar to me, credit before debit. I started with a traditional bank relationship and eventually moved to commerce. The industry has turned itself on its head. It's now commerce to banking. I have a 22-year-old daughter who may have been into a bank, I'm not sure. I have twin boys who are six years old and they'll never go into a bank. They will never go into a bank, right? Commerce to banking. So if you think about how the industry has to turn itself on its head where the role of the branch, and it's not like they're all gonna go away, but it's a place to educate people about investing or it's a place to bring communities together um, that want to interact socially or culturally in a context of commerce. It's not about standing in a line and waiting to deposit your money, right? So when we think about this journey changing from banking to commerce, from commerce to banking, it starts with what happens at the point of sale and around the point of sale with your early commerce experiences. So increasingly, when banks or networks like Visa think about how we're going to grow the industry, it's, it's, it's not driving from a bank relationship out. It's how we bring those early commerce experiences to you, that you, you, you get brand affinity or, or some kind of new experience from us or from your bank. And if we're lucky, if banks are lucky, you eventually grow and have what looks like a, a more traditional banking experience. And so when we look at the millennials and every generation afterwards, we understand that it's commerce to start with and then we have to do very special things in that journey for them to come even close to developing um, a traditional banking relationship. Uh, this has obviously you know, challenged our industry, challenged the banks, and brought a whole bunch of new players into the space. And so again, foundational to the transformation I'm talking about is it's from commerce to banking, not banking to commerce. How, how many people here have played with Amazon Echo or Google Home? Okay, so point of this slide, transactions are everywhere. You know, we, we talk about omni-channel. Um, it wasn't that long ago that we were hoping to use our mobile phone at the point of sale, but in most markets, including Italy, you can use your, your phone at almost every point of sale. Contactless has been rolled out, and now transactions are moving to many more places. For those of you that have, have played with the Amazon Echo, which is the, the voice response, the voice recognition uh, setup that Amazon has, or Google Home, which is Google's equivalent, you can use it today in the United States, the UK, Canada, a number of other markets to order Uber, and they'll tell you when it's arriving, they'll tell you how much it's gonna cost, they'll tell you the name of the driver. You can use it to order your Amazon orders that you've previously placed. You can use it now in a couple of banks to do 80% of your banking transactions strictly by voice. So we've developed an app where you can link to your bank, check your balance, pay bills, cancel your cards, um, send money to your friends, all using Amazon Echo and voice recognition. It's here today. And so when we think about where transactions are heading and where services are heading, it's, it's in channels that we've never seen before. We put a Visa digital credential in a car so that cars are talking to parking meters and automatically starting when you put it in park and stopping when you put it in driver reverse. A digital receipt on your car. Fuels, parking, tolls, quick service restaurants, insurance by the mile, um, electrical charging, and eventually smart leases, all being conducted by your car, in your car, with our credential in your car, and we've got pilots going on around the world in this regard. So transactions are everywhere. The point of sale is transforming. As I said, it's no longer walking up and standing in a queue for someone that has a card reader, it's ordering in an app and going to a shop with your name on it and just picking up your bag and going. So transactions are everywhere. We've seen the transformation of the point of sale where it took Visa 60 years to get to the point where I would say there's 40 million places you can use your Visa card around the world. In the past five years, we've added 15 million just because this mobile device can now accept payments. 
In the next five years, we'll add another 25 million. So 60 years to get to 40 million places and an extra 10 years to go from 40 million to 80 million places you can use your Visa card, physical places. Not including the number of online merchants that grows every day, not including Amazon Echo and Google Home, not including your car, not including wearables, including jewelry, clothing, and watches that you can use to pay. Transactions are everywhere. It's an enormous opportunity for the payments industry to digitize and drive cash out of the system by allowing all these devices to communicate and make payments, but it also means that we've got to work together to harness the technology to make sure that it's as secure as putting your card in and putting in a four-digit PIN. And this is what Visa and our partners spend a lot of time thinking about. So when I say transactions are everywhere, the ultimate expression is, is Amazon Go. Does, does anyone here know, or a lot of you know what Amazon Go is? So Amazon Go is a store that they've launched in, uh, in Seattle as their first pilot store. And this is what the shopping experience looks like. I walk into the store, I put things in my pocket, I walk out of the store, right? As my colleagues like to say, the use case is called shoplifting. You walk into the store, you put things in your pocket, you walk out of the store. So they've taken all the things I've talked about, virtual points of sale, your, your Visa card in the cloud, sensors, location data, payment history, all of this in one single shopping experience where you walk into the store, you put things in your pocket, and you walk out. That's the future of commerce, right? But in order to do that, we've got to harness a whole bunch of technologies, the technologies you're going to experience over the next three days in order to provide that seamless experience. It may seem futuristic. It's only one store. I can tell you that that shopping experience will be in Europe in the next 12 to 18 months. We're working with a number of our large retailers to create the equivalent of Amazon Go because we know ultimately the way that shopping should handle or should be handled is I walk into a store, I fill up my bags, and I walk out of the store. And it should work every time. So at the heart of this, what creates experiences like Amazon Go isn't just technology. Shopping is 10,000 years old, and it fundamentally hasn't changed. Right? It's basically the exchange of goods or services between a buyer or seller, whether it's through cash and now with digital and now in the cloud and now using sensors. But shopping hasn't changed in 10,000 years. What's changed is the way that new players think about it. They don't think about products, my credit card, a point of sale machine. What they think about are customer outcomes. They put design thinking and human-centered design on 10,000-year-old experiences to create entirely new businesses. When you look around this week and see some of the startups um, that are here or, see, or hear some of the pitches or see some of these emerging technologies, I guarantee that most of them will be using human-centered design and design thinking to apply new thinking to very old experiences and building entire businesses upon them. This is especially true in our industry. If you think about the loan industry, for example, 3,000-year-old business loaning, loaning money to people. There are whole startups with investments of hundreds of millions of dollars that are based on just bringing a new user experience to a loan. Not based on a new product, not based on lower interest rates, just a new user experience. Entire businesses are being built on outcomes, not products. I think this is one of the biggest challenges for banks and payment networks like Visa and others because for 60 years we've been a product company. Debit, credit, prepaid. Manual to, to digital, right? So this is really fundamental to our changing is bringing our own design thinking in and thinking more about customer outcomes, not products. Does anyone know what this is? So this is how, um, when we teach artificial intelligence, this is how we teach a robot to tell the difference between a chihuahua and a blueberry muffin. Right? So, but, but at the heart of this is, we are able to teach machines how to tell the difference between a blueberry muffin and a chihuahua. Mach machines can learn. 
But when you look at this slide, the real point of it is that one of the core things we work on at Visa in order to create that Amazon Go experience is the way that we authenticate you has got to change. Everyone is very familiar today with how we authenticate you. You go into a shop, you put your card in, you put a four-digit pin in, it's binary. The pin is right or wrong. If it's right, the transactions pass through. If it's wrong, you've got to try again, right? Or on your phone, <clears throat> I put my thumbprint on and I authenticate myself and that yes or no answer from, in this case, Android or, or Apple is sent to the networks and it says thumbprint right, thumbprint wrong, and we authenticate the transaction. To create Amazon Go, we're thinking entirely differently about authentication. For 60 years, if you watch Visa ads, you would have seen that we took this card, this plastic card, and that moment of payment, and we made it the hero. There would be that close-in photograph of the card at the point of sale, and that was the center of the shopping experience as far as we're concerned. But if you go back to the last side, when I talk about thinking about outcomes, not products, we actually talked to consumers and asked them about commerce. And they said, actually, that moment of truth, paying, it's the worst part of the experience. And if you've ever taken an Uber, you understand this. Fundamental to Uber's business is they understand that people love to shop and hate to pay. It's the worst part of the commerce experience. So Visa has turned its thinking around to say, actually, all this authentication has got to go on in the background, and we only need to co communicate with you in your commerce experience if something goes wrong. So it's going to be things like you're on your mobile phone and you're doing an e-commerce purchase, and we're passively reading your irises about 10 times a second. So by the time you select your size and how many you want and push pay, we've scanned your irises 6,000 times. So when you push the pay button, we're pretty sure it's you. Right? Or even if you swipe your card, before we say yes or no, we check that your phone is within one meter of your card because we can do that today. And there's a really high likelihood that it's a good transaction if your card and your phone are in the same place. So we'll authenticate it. Right? Or we're looking with uh, gait recognition. We've realized that the way you walk is as unique as your fingerprint. So increasingly, there'll be sensors. You'll walk in the store, and I'll know it's me because of the way I've walked. And they've walked me in the, watched me walk in the, the, the shop before. They can track me through the store. They're authenticating me over and over again. Yeah, that's his walk, that's his walk, that's his walk. And when I walk out of the store, they go, yeah, it's still his walk. It's me. I was in uh, Tel Aviv earlier this week and uh, met this little startup technology and they do what's called behavioral biometrics. So what they do is they, they look at your phone and the way you behave with your phone. The way that your thumb roams over your phone, the order in which you push the keys, the average pressure, how many, ha how many fingers you hold it with, the angle in relation to your face, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, between 100 and 200 vectors, all passively. So whether I've got my card in my hand or I'm on, an, on a mobile commerce site, they're just passively saying, yeah, this is Bill Gatta. He's behaving with his phone the way he usually does. And so by the time I push pay, they know it's me because I'm still behaving the way I do with my phone. But they go one step further. If they're not sure it's me because I'm doing something differently, they take a key, one key on my phone, and move it a couple microns. And I don't even know they've done it. It's subconscious. But as a result, I have to slightly change my thumb in order to reach that key. And now they can remeasure that it's me and authenticate that transaction. So even if they have to step up the authentication, if they have to recheck that it's me, they can do that passively so that it's all happening in the background. This is the future of authentication. We should only have to talk to you if something goes wrong. So I don't think it'll be long before the notion of using your thumb proactively or putting in your pin, all that's going away. Even if we don't get all the way to bright in terms of Amazon Go in every shop, increasingly, whoa, increasingly, if uh, you're on your phone conducting commerce, we're going to be authenticating you in the background so when it's time to push pay, you're just going to pay.
So for all of us then, this may seem pretty simplistic, having an app strategy is essential, but what we realize in commerce, it's not just my app. If I'm Visa or if I'm the bank, it's a global app strategy. Because I want to be able to put my Visa card in my Android phone, or maybe I like Samsung, and it's Samsung Pay, or Apple Pay, or how many merchants' websites, or how many apps that are tethered to my wearables, or how many travel apps that I can actually do payment through. And so increasingly, it's not good enough for us or to our banks to say, I have an app. I've got a mobile banking app. Because we know that you're going to conduct commerce where you want to conduct commerce, that transactions are happening everywhere. And so we've got to think about apps and app strategies globally. Even local banks have customers that travel, so they've, they've got to think globally for the first time in their lives about what their app strategy is. And so it's just not good enough for anyone in the ecosystem to say, well, I've just built an app. Because you've really got to be thinking about the 50,000 apps and more that are developed every day that are going to conduct commerce. This is, again, a, a big challenge for our industry. It's, it's shrinking the way we think about it because we're becoming so global, um, but it's a challenge because commerce is happening everywhere. And if you think about IoT, there won't even be humans involved. And so if you think you need passive authentication, and, and you need an app strategy, you really need it when a machine is initiating a transaction and a machine on the other side is completing it. And so again, as an industry, we think a lot, not just about our own apps, um, but about how apps are being developed globally, how we think about security in those apps globally, how we create app standards. So if you guys are writing commerce apps in your future, you can write with certainty to say, if I do it this way, Anybody who has a Visa card can put that card in my app, and I know it'll work. And so these app strategies, not just ours, are becoming very important. So again, if you're sitting you know, comfortably in Italy or other markets as a bank, or maybe uncomfortably because of all this, all this is happening, the, the way we think about it is from bank branch. As I said, I'm old enough that I actually visited my branch for several years um, to operating systems. You know, it, in five years from now, I, I hope that most of you are thinking about your favorite bank, if you think about your bank at all, that they've become an operating system. And if you think about really what an operating system is, it's a global platform that can host a number of applications that are relevant to you across a number of devices in almost every market. That, that's, a, that's, that's an operating system. Right? If you think about Facebook, Facebook's really an operating system. Right? WhatsApp is becoming an operating system. It has all of those characteristics. So if we think about where the industry is going and how the major players are going to succeed or fail in it, it's going to be based on from bank branch to, to operating system and how they create themselves as an operating system that's relevant to you, where you are, the platforms you're on, the, the apps that you want to use, the devices that you're on. We've all got to behave like operating systems if we're going to be successful. As I said when I started, you know, the, the industry was very comfortable because it was really this, this club between banks and networks, and we got to decide the pace of change. One thing that's happened with the emergence of all this technology, the big players like Facebook, Google, Amazon, Samsung, Apple coming on board, is that more and more power is moving to the merchants. So when Visa thinks about its future and, and how we're going to grow the ecosystem, we, we, we continue to think about our banks. But increasingly, we also think about our merchants. And if you think about the problem that the merchants have, the fundamental problem that we can solve with all this technology is today, if I walk into a store and pay for something, the merchant doesn't know I'm there until I'm on my way out. He doesn't know I'm there until I give them my card or tap my phone. And so that whole time I've been in the store, all those things he could have done with me to create a better experience, are lost because he doesn't know I'm there until I check out. And so we spent a lot of time um, in our innovation center in, in, in around the world talking to merchants about how we can use all this technology I talked about, this passive authentication, these sensors, this location on your mobile phone to tell the merchant when you're checking in, not checking out. Because if they know when you're checking into the store, think about Amazon Go, they've recognized my gate or maybe they've scanned my irises um, or maybe there's a location-based pinging my phone, and they go, Bill's walked into the store, 
Now that merchant can create a completely different relationship with me while I'm in there. Sending me to the right aisle because they know what I shop every, for every time and they want, to, they want me to have a more seamless experience. Or providing real-time offers or discounts to me because they know how often I visit the store, how, how much I spend, and, 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 and where they want to drive me in terms of expanding my, my basket. So when we think about what's in it for merchants in this, this new kind of multi-channel, omni-commerce universe, we're moving from checkout to check-in. And increasingly, when you walk into a store, with your permission, of course, and that's important, merchants are going to be able to drive a new experience with you because they know when you come in, not just when you go out. So just to finish, if you think about all the things I've talked about, it's not just about embracing new technologies and, and, and working with new partners and you know, trying out uh, new services. It's, it's really about changing the way that we work at Visa. Um, and for those of you that are, are you know, in the technology sphere um, or, or thinking about entering it, I'd say the biggest change at Visa in terms of innovation in the last three years isn't the introduction of our APIs and our developer system. It's not the introduction of token, the way that we can put a credential safely in any device. It's changing the way that we think about our business and the way that we interact with our partners. So we've gone from two yearly releases, a, a release every six months, standard across the world, global mandates, technical implementation letters, every bank in the world waiting for Visa's release every six months. To where now, if you visit our innovation centers around the world, in three or four days, using design thinking and rapid prototyping, we're developing new services. Right? So it's going from product, as I said, to these new services, learning how to succeed or fail fast. Certainly APIs and tokens are at the core of it, but as much as anything, it's a willingness to take more risks. It's a willingness to fail fast. And, and at Visa until three years ago, we'd never talk about failure because our network had to work at seven nines. Visa hasn't lost an, an authorization in 60 years. And we do about 30,000 a second. Right? So this has been a fundamental shift for the industry in terms of how we have to connect to new companies who can only talk to us with APIs, who can only do agile development. Right? So I'd say when we think about um, the, the change in innovation at Visa, it's really been focusing on rapid prototypes, agile development, failing fast, and introducing new technologies and new, part, new partners into the process. Um, so as I said again, Visa's uh, delighted to be uh, sponsoring this year's uh, campus party. We know that the next uh, two or three days are going to be a lot of fun and, and hopefully informative for a lot of streams that you're going to see here tonight. Um, this is just uh, to leave you with uh, an idea of the investments that we're making in innovation. I live in London now, head up our, our innovation centers in London and Dubai and Berlin and Warsaw, Tel Aviv. But we've also got big centers in our headquarters in San Francisco, Singapore, Miami, New York. So when we think about innovation and payments, Europe is extremely important to the way Visa thinks about innovation. But we also think about it and share innovation globally. And I hope that you know, one of the things you'll see here today is that a lot of the technologies and the themes are um, you know, certainly relevant for Europe, uh, but these are global themes, and all the things I talked about tonight aren't just happening here in Europe. Uh, these are changes that, uh, that we see uh, around the world. Um, so again, um, I know at least for me it's getting late. It's probably just starting for most of you, but I, uh, I appreciate your time and uh, enjoy the next two days. Thank you very much.